Hello and welcome, everybody. I'm Rachel, your host of All for Animals podcast, and today we're going to be talking about kind of a gnarly topic, (laughs) but we're going to get through it together, I promise. We're going to talk about the very real dangers of cat bites. A lot of people, especially anybody working with animals and cats in particular, are taught extremely early on in their training that a cat bite that draws blood equals an immediate trip to the doctor. The reason for this is because cat bites are more than twice as likely to become infected as a dog bite. And those infections can be horrifying. We're talking literally threatening to both life and limb. A study published in the February 2014 issue of the Journal of Hand Surgery states that one in three people with a cat bite will not only wind up with an infection, but will actually have to be hospitalized for it. The average time these people were hospitalized was about three days, and about 20% of them even required surgery to undo the damage caused by the bite and then the subsequent infection. So those are some really staggering odds, and it also explains, I mean, why a lot of groomers don't like to work with cats. The risk is just too much. But hey, groomers also get bitten by dogs all the time too, so what's up with that? Why are dog bites not nearly as problematic as their feline counterparts? Well, apparently, it has to do a lot with the shape of their teeth. So think about it. Cat teeth are sharper than dog's teeth are, meaning that they can sink way deeper into your flesh. They're like little needles. And those dagger-like teeth are almost injecting all of that nasty bacteria into your body, into your skin, and making it impossible for you to ever be able to wash out the bacteria that was in the cat's mouth from the wound completely. Can you say faster? I mean, come on, it's, it's, it's going to create the perfect environment for all kinds of bacteria to just run amok. Amok, amok, amok. And bites to the hand are going to also be the most dangerous. And unfortunately, they're also the most common since our hands are what we use to handle the cats that we're either working or playing with. Now, the reason for hand bites being the most dangerous is best explained by Dr. Brian Carlisle from the Mayo Clinic, who says, quote, The cat's teeth are sharp, and they can penetrate very deeply. They can seed bacteria in the joint and tendon sheaths, and it can be just a, t- a pinpoint bite mark that can cause a real problem, because the bacteria get into the tendon sheath or into the joint where they can then grow with relative protection from the blood and immune system, unquote. And if you think about it, since the tendons in our hands are what control things, like our ability to move our fingers, any disruption to those tendons is going to affect the mobility and usability of that hand, fingers, whatever part it is that's currently being affected. So high stakes here. Now, just for a little added context, I went, I went digging for some numbers. Animal bites account for around 1% of all emergency room visits each year. But obviously, that's going to include all different kinds of animals. So to get more specific, according to the AVMA, or the American Veterinary Medical Association, Over 4.5 million people are bitten by dogs in the U.S. every year, and there are over 400,000 cat bites. Oh, and just in case anyone wanted to know, (laughs) because for some reason this little statistic was lumped in with the cats and dogs, but um, there are about 250,000 human bites every year in the U.S. Um... First off, I'm not sure why that's lumped in with the, the, the critters, but um, is it just me or does that, seem, that number seem extraordinarily high? I'm, I'm just a wee bit emotionally scarred from that information, but I guess we'll move on from that so I don't spiral. So just, 
keep your shape to yourself, okay? And then we'll be we'll be set. So I'm pretty sure most people are aware of the preliminary signs of an infection. But just in case there's anyone out there in listener land who needs a reminder, those signs are going to be redness, the wound feeling hot to the touch, oozing, pus, foul smelling, swelling, fever, and increased pain. So it's going to be pretty hard to ignore any of these symptoms, especially if this bite is in a place like your hand, because every time you go to move your hand, it's going to more than likely be excruciatingly painful. And if you have a cat bite and notice any of those symptoms, guess what? You have won a trip to the ER. (laughs) But in all seriousness, pet peeps, if you have any of those symptoms, you need medical care as soon as humanly possible to hopefully avoid some major surgery, hospitalization, nerve and muscle damage, or even the loss of limbs. Because even losing a finger can drastically affect the way you go about your life. Like me as a groomer, if I lost any of my fingers, that might compromise my ability to properly do my job. Because so much of my work is in all of the tiny, fine, minute details. And in the animal handling too, I need as much dexterity as I can possibly muster to be able to properly handle, restrain, and even just get the right technique for grooming. And like anybody who works with grooming shears knows that there's a very specific way that you have to hold them. Certain fingers have to go in the the certain holes. You, You lose one of those fingers, you might never be able to hold your scissors again. That's a big deal. So the most common little nasties that are delivered in cat bites Now, forgive me, everybody, because I am a dog groomer. I am not a biologist. I did not learn how to properly pronounce these words, but we're going to give it the old college try here. Moraxella, Fusobacterium, Bacteroides, Pasturella multocida, MRSA, Bartonella hensley, otherwise known as cat scratch fever, Staphylococcus, and Streptococcus. And up to 90% of those nasty infections are going to come from that Pasturella multocida. And that's without taking into account the risk of rabies or even tetanus. Now, those little guys are pretty damn scary all by themselves, but unfortunately it actually gets worse from there. They can actually lead to even more problems. So like the infection is secondary to the cat bite. So now I guess we're talking about tertiary problems here. Things such as necrotizing fasciitis, otherwise known as flesh-eating bacteria, septic arthritis, which is an infection of the synovial fluid and joint tissue, so essentially an infection causing joint pain and arthritis, osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone, and then there's tenosynovitis, which is infection in a tendon. And We talked about that earlier about how much tendons influence the uh, ability to use our hands. So you may be wondering what steps should you take if you do get a cat bite that penetrates your skin? Obviously the very, very first thing that you're gonna need to do is somehow secure the cat or get away from it if it's like a stray or something like that um, and make sure that it can't hurt you or anybody else around you again. Then you're going to clean the bitten area with a gentle soap and warm water as quickly as possible. You wanna clean that area as best you can. Then you're gonna need to apply firm pressure to the area with a clean towel or gauze, something like that, to stop any bleeding. And then once you've gotten the bleeding to stop, it's time to either A, call your doctor and get a prescription for antibiotics, which by the way, that that option only is going to work for very minor bites. Or the second option B, is going to be heading to the ER for the more severe bites and also if you are in need of any stitches. Or even things like an updated tetanus shot, which is also recommended if you um, haven't been vaccinated within the last five to 10 years for, a, they call it like a dirty scratch or dirty wound. Um, it's one that's like way more likely to deposit um, the 
nasty bacteria in there. So even if it hasn't been the usual 10 years for an, a tetanus shot, at least my doctors have recommended if it's been over five years to have me go ahead and get another tetanus shot, which is something I didn't know until my first bite experience. So now you guys are welcome and you know too. <laughs> and here we go. So this is my my big disclaimer here. It's going to be on all of your prescription bottles. And I'm sure your doctor is going to tell you too. But be sure, everybody, be very, very sure to take every single antibiotic pill. Even if you're already starting to feel better. Even if the swelling has gone down, it's not oozing anymore, it's not hurting. It's extremely important to make sure all the bacteria are completely annihilated. That will help to make sure that you don't get another infection or even an abscess, which is essentially an infection that your body has walled off in an attempt to prevent it from spreading further and, and creating even more damage. But being walled off doesn't make that infection just go away. And in fact, it can actually, it can make it much more difficult for antibiotics to reach the infected area. So again, we take all our antibiotics, people. Promise, promise, promise. <laughs> and make sure to follow your doctor's directions on the wound care as well. This will help to prevent further scarring and it can even possibly help you to avoid some of the more severe complications, even surgeries, things like that. Very important to follow those directions. Now, speaking of those severe complications, friend of the pod, Katie, was kind enough to share her story of how a very seemingly small bite turned into an extraordinarily large problem. And oh boy, is it a doozy. So I'm going to go ahead and place a trigger warning here because poor Katie has gone through quite a lot. Now, this only happened this year, so it's a long story, so buckle up, people, and I want everybody to remember that this only happened in August. There's a lot of information here, so it's going to make it seem like this has been going on for years, but no, all of this misery has been packed into, what is it, four short months. <laughs> all right, so on August 18th, 2023, there was a Facebook post in my city's community group saying there had been a cat wandering the neighborhood for weeks and they had it in their garage. The animal shelter would not take them and no one was claiming the cat. So after multiple people chimed in, turns out these people had sold their house and left their kitten behind. So I didn't tell my husband what I was doing and decided to go get the cat and surprise my son. The cat was in rough shape and obviously sick, so I brought it to the vet. It was severely malnourished, dehydrated, and had a botfly larva on its throat that had to be pulled out, respiratory infection, and also had an infection in his paw. And he had pus coming from in between his paws. We were sent home with antibiotics, and since he was so sick, I kept him separated from my other animals. That was a very good, good plan, Katie. Just going to interject there. I gave him a bath and walked out of the bathroom, holding him to go back into my bedroom. My German Shepherd Husky was outside the door and scared the crap out of it. The cat bit down on my thumb for about 25 seconds as I was holding it tight and trying to open my bedroom door. My husband was on our side lot and heard me screaming and came running inside. I had just a small bite on my thumb, other than multiple scratches. This was totally my fault that it happened. The cat was the most loving, sweetest thing ever. I don't think it was your fault, Katie. I think it was just kind of one of those freak things where you couldn't predict that your dog was going to go all crazy about the cat and scare it. Nobody was at fault. It was just the way things are, unfortunately. Fast forward five days. My thumb is super sore and just a little bit red. I didn't expect anything serious since it wasn't swollen and obviously it would get sore from being bitten. I finally decided to go into urgent care and they immediately sent me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, they told me they would be admitting me and I would be getting sent up to my own room. Apparently, they see cat bites all the time and getting put on antibiotics for three days uh, via IV takes care of the issue. However, this did not take care of the issue. My hands started swelling up and I was taken into surgery. 
They said that I had a large abscess touching my nerve and they think that they cleaned all of the infection out. I was sent home a few days later. During the time I was there, my husband called me and said the cat is not doing well and looks like he's dying. I had brought him into the vet, or I'm sorry, I had him bring it to the vet again and they said that they think it's best to put him down as he was very sick. We got him tested for rabies and thank God it was negative. I'm so glad that, that you at least didn't have to worry about that part. But man, this next part stings. $2,200 in vet bills for a cat that we didn't even get to keep. My son was heartbroken. I'm so sorry, you guys. You went through so much, are still going through so much, and you didn't even get to keep the poor little guy. I was home for about a week in the most excruciating pain I've ever been in. Super drugged up, dripping in sweat 24-7 from all of the drugs, and very confused. The infection took over my body to the point that I slept 20 hours a day. I could not eat or function, and I lost 15 pounds. I could not lift up my infect infected hand without using my other hand to hold it up. Ice packs on my hands 24-7 was the only thing that touched the pain. My hands started swelling up again, so I called the surgeon, and they said that was normal. A few days later, my hand started oozing a lot of pus from the stitches. I called the surgeon again and was told to go back into the emergency room and was immediately admitted once again. Oh, jeez. Infectious disease control was involved now. I had multiple tests done to try to narrow down what kind of infection this cat gave me. Surgery was done the next morning. This time I had a different surgeon, and he said he got a shot glass worth of pus out of... Uh, out and that my infection was getting worse. They could not treat me here and they wanted to transfer me to a different hospital that had hand plastic surgery specialists. My dad drove me to said hospital and I was prepped for emergency surgery. This time they opened my hand 15 times more than the first hospital did. And uh, Katie included some pictures of the varying um, wounds that she received to her hand and arm during this whole process and I will be including those on Instagram for those who are bold enough to check them out but I will also make sure to warn everybody in that post that they're um they're a little they're a little gory <laughs> um they told my dad and husband that they might need to amputate my hand and they are trying to do everything they can to save it they stated that they were very disappointed in the first hospital, saying they did not do their due diligence and that this wouldn't have gone this far if they did. Since my infection was so bad, they literally left both sides of my hand wide open. Whew, I shudder to think. Nerves, muscles, tendons, you name it, they were all sticking out. I can't believe I didn't bleed to death. My hand was wrapped up in bandages and they had to change this twice a day. Ooh, I made the mistake of looking while they were changing it and I almost passed out. Oh my God. Whew, that is so traumatic to think of your skin just basically being flayed open like that. I Props to you for getting through this, Katie. Whew. A few days later, I had, a I had surgery number four. This time they told me the infection has moved to my bones and my tendons and they are very worried that they're going to have to amputate my hand. They left both sides wide open again so that they can continue to clean out the infection. They were super worried as there was no growth on my bacterial culture, so they had no idea what infection they were treating. I was pumped with a broad spectrum of five different antibiotics through my IV all day and night during my hospital stay. A few days later again, surgery number five. This time they were able to stitch up the back side of my hand, but the front side was so swollen they couldn't stitch it up. I needed a skin graft done, which means they had to take skin from another part of my body in order to stitch me back up. They weren't sure if this was going to work or not, but they tried their best. A couple more days go by and surgery number six happens. They yet again cleaned out the infection and continued with the skin graft so they could stitch me up. I stayed in the hospital for about five more days after this. This hospital round, I was here a total of 18 days. They were finally ready to let me go home, but I needed an IV pick line in order to do antibiotics myself. This is not a normal IV. Instead of just going into my vein, it is a line that goes all the way to my heart, which I don't know why, but imagining I, I, that feels like it, 
I've never had anything close to that um, done to me. Would that hurt in your heart? I have to know. If anybody's ever had a pick line, please let me know, because that just sounds very painful. During all this time, it was very difficult for everybody, as I could not do anything on my own, and I couldn't help out. Family members were constantly taking my son and were in and out of the house taking care of me. I surprisingly lost relationships with family members because of this. You would think that they would be there for me and have my back, but I guess not. I'm so sorry, Katie. I also gained relationships from family members that I hadn't had anything to do with me in 15 years. I guess it takes me almost dying to have someone want to be a part of your life again. Well... I, I, I guess I'm going to call that a silver lining. At the very least, you gained some people out of it. Being home, finally, was probably worse than being in the hospital. The process of doing these IV antibiotics is insane, and I had to do it five times a day. That means I was hooked up to a line for multiple hours five times a day. I had an in-home nurse and physical therapist come to my house three to four days a week. This went on for over a month until infectious disease control said I was ready to get my pick line pulled out. I'm sure that had to be an absolute, uh, a, a gigantic relief. I can't even imagine. 26 days total in the hospital and six surgeries during that time. I am still to this day on oral antibiotics and I have two to four surgeries in my future when my hand is more healed. I cannot even explain how crazy these last four months have been. I have a long way to go with physical therapy to get my hand working again. I have a pretty gnarly scar, too. Wow is the only word I can come up with to describe what you have been through, Katie. And I want to sincerely thank you for sharing your story and pictures with all of us. And listeners are going to be able to find those pictures documenting the bite and all of the surgeries that have come since on the show's Instagram, All for Animals podcast. Now, I've wanted to ask if any of my lovely listeners have any experience with this. If you've got a bite story of your own, whether from a cat or any other critter for that matter, send it on in. I'd, I'd really like to hear from you and, and share your story too, if, if you so choose. Just <laughs> please no human bites. I'm not sure my heart can take it. <laughs> you can send your stories, minus human bites, to allforanimalspodcast at gmail.com. And remember, too, you can always remain anonymous if you so choose. Just let me know somewhere in that email. All right. Everybody remember to be a little extra cautious when handling unfamiliar cats and never, ever, ever ignore signs of infection in a bite. And I'll see you next time. Say, stay safe, everybody. <laughs>